Okay, we're going to move on to the next speaker, and it's my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Roger Paredes, who is the head of the Infectious Disease Department um, at the um, IRSI Caixa AIDS Re Research Institute in Barcelona. He is an MD and a PhD he received from the, uh, in medicine and surgery from the Autonomous University of Barcelona, the other UAB. Um, and he specialized in HIV research. Um, his group has led many studies. Um, and one really particular area is the HIV deep, deep sequencing um, uses in both high and low income settings. And because of his background in virology, he kind of stepped um, up to the plate for COVID in Spain and really helped to lead the, um, he's been the Spanish national coordinator uh, of the, some of the randomized trials that happened in, in Spain and also um, really working to develop standards of care for people um, with COVID, um, working on treatment guidelines. And he's also worked with the WHO on their drug resistance um, program and has a lot of, um, I think is in a really unique uh, position to talk about pathogenesis of long COVID, um, really drawing from much of his work uh, in virology and HIV. So Dr. Paredes, thank you for, for being with us here today. So thank you very much, Dr. Career and, and Dr. Del Rio, also for IES for the opportunity to, to speak with you today. These are my financial uh, relationships um, and also the learning objectives of these uh, talks. So let me start by saying that uh, long COVID is real. Uh, not only that, long COVID is here to stay. So in these uh, large uh, perspective cohort uh, patients in France, you can see how on the left-hand side, how a uh, very significant amount of patients they have symptoms such as fatigue, cough, loss of change of taste. And some of them remain stable, others decrease and others increase, like for example, paresthesias over time. But what is more striking uh, to me is the right-hand side. So how, you can see how is the disease impacting on patients in, in several levels of, of their uh, re, uh, usual life. And you can see a U-shaped uh, curve that actually shows uh, that so uh, the perception of the disease gets worse as patients uh, begin to realize that this is a condition that is not uh, living. So our role as clinicians is to acknowledge this condition, try to understand it as much as we can and find, find treatments. So what is long COVID? Long COVID is a multisystemic post-viral disease that has a, a, a wide a range of organ and tissue uh, damage going from the heart, lungs, immune system, blood vessels, neurological system, so on and so forth. Um, and, and as has been mentioned, uh, there is a question, there is debate on whether this is a single entity or maybe there are sub-syndromes. And we have this really key paper that was recently published by the Recover study in which you can see that patients cluster around at least four clusters. Uh, but what is interesting to see here is that these are not independent clusters. Uh, rather, uh, these are uh, patients have additive symptoms. There's a lot of overlap uh, among these different clusters. And, and, and for example, if you go from cluster one has essentially smell and taste and plus other symptoms, on, on that you have post-exertional malaise and fatigue. And then cluster three, for example, adds brain fog and cluster four adds dizziness, palpitations, and gastrointestinal disturbance with a, with a large overlap. So the question is whether these are independent subsyndromes or maybe uh, um, 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 an incremental uh, impact of, of, of the same disease. This is data from our uh, long COVID unit, which is uh, led by Dr. Lourdes Mateo, and which in our case, we see this is a perspective of systematic evaluation. We also see clusters. We see three clusters in this case. And on the right-hand side, you can see as well how uh, each cluster uh, adds on top of the previous uh, symptoms of the previous one, uh, with cluster A being the cluster with the less amount of symptoms, and cluster C, it's a cluster with, where patients have really a lot, a lot of, of symptoms. Um, these clusters might be used, and this is data from our, our group, to maybe predict uh, which are the chances of improving over time. So, for example, we see that patients with smell and taste and hyperexia might be uh, slightly more likely to recover over two years, although only 7.6% of all patients recover uh, over two years, whereas patients who start with myalgia, dyspnea, tachycardia, or neurocognitive disorders are much less likely to recover. So these symptoms actually uh, confer a prognostic value. Then 
when we talk about long COVID, we, we give different names to the disease and we try to systematize what we are talking about. Um, so uh, in the US, uh, everybody, took, I mean, the term most frequently used is post-acute uh, COVID sequelae. Post-acute COVID sequelae, it's, it's, it's a good term. It's, it's operational. It, it, it doesn't have a priorism. But the point here is that it might contain inside post-intensive care, uh, patients with post-intensive care uh, syndromes, symptoms, also patients with perhaps midterm sequelae, like some, some sequelae that might improve over time. And then um, the real, uh, let's say, the or long COVID, which is uh, most post-viral, even in mild COVID-19, with very complex immunopathogenesis. This question is still uh, being solved, but uh, terminology is also uh, very important. My first, uh, the first uh, point I want to make is that there is real organic damage. Uh, most of the attendees in this meeting are probably believers in long COVID, but we have to acknowledge that out there, there's still a lot of people who think that this is a disease that some patients might just make up, uh, or patients might just want to obtain benefits out of it. That's uh, not true. Uh, uh, there might be a f perhaps a few, of course, but th there's real organ damage. First of all, in this uh, picture here, you see the incident composite cardiovascular, neurological, and gastrointestinal outcomes um, from a very large uh, data set in the Veterans Affairs uh, cohorts in the US, where you see both uh, the, hazard, the hazard ratio and the excess burden per 1,000 persons uh, of, of different uh, composite outcomes. And you can see that, yes, uh, people who have been in the ICU have a much uh, larger excess burden uh, of any of these uh, these outcomes. But also in green, you see how still people who have not been in the ICU continue to have a significant increase uh, uh, risk, but also a burden per 1,000 persons over time. And, and this is not leaving. This is going to stay, and then our, our healthcare systems will be increasingly increasingly under pressure because of all these, because the, all these symptoms and outcomes have a strong, strong impact. Uh, also, uh, a portion of our, our patients have chest pain. Uh, for example, in this case, in our uh, long COVID unit, we evaluated 27% um, of patients had chest pain, and you can see the results. This is just to put an example of the first 10 patients that were evaluated using um, adenosine uh, stress MRI, and you see essentially three patterns. One on the top is subendocardial ischemia in patients who are young without other risk factors and with normal coronary art arteries. So these patients do have uh, ischemia, heart ischemia, and they are, uh, the, which is really limiting. Also, uh, in two patients, there was like myocarditis, um, uh, late gadolinium enhancement, and of course, you can still find uh, three uh, patients with, with normal CMR findings. There are more findings that have been described. Another very important and objective uh, outcome of, of long COVID is the inappropriate sinus tachycardia, or, or also POTS uh, syndrome, which in, in our unit affects 20% of our long COVID patients. And you can see here how using objective measures, you can certainly, for example, here on the right-hand side, there's a point at a blood where you see heart rate variability. In uninfected patients in the top, you see more variability in the heart rate, whereas in long COVID, there's uh, clearly and objectively uh, less uh, variability in the heart rate and this and makes uh, patients, uh, so it puts patients at higher difficulties to cope when with stress, for example, um, uh, when they need a, a, a stress uh, response, and it suggests a cardiac autonomic nervous system imbalance with decreased parasympathetic activity. In a recent uh, work that we have uh, available now as a preprint, uh, we compared uh, patients with, uh, so one of the explanations is that the vagus nerve could be, could be affected. Um, uh, so we included patients with long COVID who had uh, dyspnea, a dysphonia, and in this study led by Chamallados, uh, we compared them with patients who had recovered from, from COVID-19 and also with uninfected patients. And, and, and patients with long COVID have a um, much higher amount, number of symptoms, but also alterations in the uh, vagus echocardiography, for example, dysphagia, dysphonia. And what is interesting is like more than 60% of our, our patients have reductions in, in maximum inspiratory pressure. So even with normal lungs, when you do functional analysis, you can see that uh, you can find an explanation of why these patients have, have dyspnea. Uh, 
So I hope I convinced you that uh, there's organicity. So which are the mechanisms? Uh, so um, there are several mechanisms and these, uh, which have been proposed, and this is being discussed. Uh, here I show you a summary of the hypothesized mechanisms. Essentially, they include immune dysregulation um, due to possibly viral persistence, also microbiota dysbiosis, autoimmunity has been involved, blood clotting and endothelial abnormalities, and as I mentioned before, is functional neurological signaling. Let's go for a persistence of, of SARS-CoV-2. So this has become already a classical, a classical paper in which there were a number of, of patients who died from COVID-19 that were, uh, that these are autopsy results, and essentially showing that, uh, that uh, the authors were able to detect uh, using digital droplet uh, PCR, they were able to detect virus persistence in, in many different uh, tissues in, in, in the organ, including the brain. But I highlighted here on the right-hand side also because everybody thinks about the brain, which is fine, but also there's virus in the thyroids, in the esophagus, spleen, also in the adrenal glands, in the ovary, in testes, and endometrium. So SARS-CoV-2 was found uh, essentially everywhere. In this study by Zollner and colleagues, they did uh, endoscopies, uh, gut endoscopies in patients with uh, inflammatory bowel uh, disease. And then essentially, they were able to find virus in uh, using uh, PCRs uh, with multiple targets, with four different targets. Um, they were able to find virus in at least 70% of, of, of patients, up to seven months. Uh, and such viruses were found in the duodenum, in the ileum, and the colon as well. So it's everywhere in all these different parts of the of the small uh, intestine. And also they were found inside the epithelium and in CD8 uh, T cells. Uh, so the virus is there, but which are the consequences? What is interesting in these studies is that only patients with a positive uh, SARS-CoV-2 RNA had uh, symptoms uh, related with post-acute COVID, COVID syndrome or, or long COVID whereas none of the negatives uh, did, uh, have those symptoms. So suggesting that presence of, of virus in, in intestinal tissues is indeed associated with, with, with uh, the clinical, clinical symptoms. There is a, in another, another study which has become a classical in the, in the field by Gabler and colleagues, they already showed a uh, presence of, of virus in, in different um, intestinal tissues, including duodenum or terminal ileum, but what is important also is that they associated this with a continuous uh, turnover in uh, the uh, B cell uh, clonality, for example, and also increases in hypermutation in the variable regions uh, uh, in the, of the heavy chain and the, and, the, and the light chain, showing that actually this persistent or suggesting that the pers persistence of the virus uh, continues to provide antigen stimulation and, pro and produces continued evolution. Of, of the immune of the immune response, which might be good on some hand, but also could be, be detrimental depending on the type of, of immune response that happens. Of course, one of the limitations for uh, advancing in the long COVID uh, um, science is that a current lack of objective biomarkers that we can use and, and in an operational way in the clinic. But uh, however, there um, uh, Swank and colleagues suggested and showed that actually you can detect persistent circulating spike, uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike using a highly sensitive quantitative assay, which uh, they uh, modified a little bit. And, and, and actually you, you find it in patients with PACs and, and, and you don't find anything in patients uh, with acute COVID who did not develop PACs. Um, um, the groups were slightly different, but, but this is really highly, highly promising. Um, most of the detection was uh, uh, of a, the spike uh, rather than, for example, the N antigen or the S1. There are a number of, of reasons that are suggested here, but at least it opens the door to uh, a potential uh, biomarker in, in, in blood, which would, could be actionable and could, be, uh, could help us select patients, for example, for, for clinical trials, although more validation is needed. These um, uh, persistent, these circulating with SARS-CoV-2 spikes uh, remain persistently detectable in, in a group of, of, of past patients. And they, it's more frequent, uh, they are more frequently detected if there's ongoing cardiovascular, systemic, or musculoskeletal uh, symptoms. Also, if there are acute gastrointestinal neuropsychiatric symptoms, and also the greater the number of organ systems involved. 
interestingly, in this study, there were no differences in, in a number of soluble uh, biomarkers. So the virus persists. Perhaps we can detect it in, in blood, and this is something we need to really uh, advance and continue doing science in this. What about immune consequences? Well, we all know that uh, acute COVID-19 creates a huge uh, uh, disturbance in, 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 in acute immune system response. However, in a, in a group of patients, this leads to the dysfunctional bridge that includes T-cell and MK MK cell exhaustion. And then the adaptive Im immunity, uh, um, there are changes in T-cell activation and T-cell activation. There are many papers out there, and I ask uh, 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 forgiven for uh, not including uh, all of them. I focused on essentially a very large one that showed uh, it was a really comprehensive a comprehensive work, um, but and, and showed very interesting data. Uh, zooming into cellular markers, for example, you can find these authors find the increased uh, non-conventional monocytes, activated and double negative B cells, exhausted P4 and CD8, and also an increase in the intracellular production of IL-2, IL-4 and IL-6 after stimulation with, with PMA, and also decreases in DC1 and central memory T cell subsets. Um, in a generalized linear mixed models predictive model, IL uh, for uh, producing C4 T cells and IL6 producing C4 T cells were significantly associated with, with long COVID. Looking at the soluble markers and compared with healthy controls, there were a number of soluble markers that you can see here that were elevated. Oh, please note also the a big overlap between, between the groups. I mean, there's an important dispersion, but significant differences. And interestingly, patients with long COVID had lower Adam TS13, which is actually a uh, metalloprotein S that cleaves the um, uh, von Willebrand factor. So that could have some linkage also with, with microthrombosis. Autoimmunity. So autoimmunity, we know that uh, SARS-CoV-2 induces autoimmunity. The problem here is that autoimmunity is widespread. It's a widespread against many different antigens. There are anti-immune reactions, but they are not always to the same antigen. So first, this is going to be very difficult to tackle in the clinic, uh, at least in the short term, unless someone develops a, an easier, an easier uh, to do test. And also in these studies were not significant uh, differences in terms of autoimmunity. So autoimmunity is there, but it's difficult to, to handle in the clinic. It has been uh, this same uh, paper, this is from Akiko Wasaki's group uh, in Yale, but also in, in with uh, researchers from New York. Um, they also showed uh, signs of possible herpes virus reactivation by essentially looking mostly of EBV uh, lytic antigens uh, during in patients with long COVID and some uh, varicella zoster antigens. So this is another hypothesis that is being, is being uh, evaluated. Looking at the biochemistry, what was looked very, very, very interesting in this paper was that there was a, a very clear separation between long COVID and historical and, uh, and historical cohort um, in, in cortisol levels. And this is something we need to dig deeper because the signal was very, very clear. Only cortisol on its own, among the different factors that were analyzed, was able to, to separate very well uh, the, the groups. And, and these means, however, when you look at the cortisol, uh, so cortisolemia was lower in, in patients with long COVID, but for example, ACTH was, was, was not, was, was not different. So, so we need really to, this open the door to understanding a little bit better what's going on uh, also uh, in, in the brain and also in the pathalamus and maybe the, the pituitary gland. And, and I think we need to, to, to understand much better um, the, the cortical uh, adrenal uh, axis. And this could be uh, also an area of, of further investigation. Finally, we have systemic uh, endotheliopathy. So we know that COVID-19 infection induces inflammation. This creates also SARS-CoV-2 damages the, the endothelial directly. And there's massive von Willebrand factor release with excess of, of all these molecules. This leads to microthrombosis and it ultimately increases in the dimer. So you can see, for example, here on the right-hand side, uh, infiltrates, uh, this is an alveolar uh, space with infiltrates of, with, with, with lymphocyte, lymphocytic infiltrate, uh, uh, perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate, and also all these um, uh, arrows here on the right-hand side point to microthrombus. Uh, so these thrombi remain there and remain there for a while. This leads to uh, chronic hypoxia. 
And this image uh, that you find that you see here below in black and white, on the left hand side is a normal alveolus uh, structure, but on the right hand side you see really a pathogenic alveolus structure that has been subject to chronic hypoxia. And there, what you have is into, into susceptive angiogenesis, which is a reaction that uh, the, the capillary veins uh, produce uh, in front of uh, um, hypoxia. They grow and they also grow inside themselves and, and, and they make a, a chronified hypoxia um, quite, um, for, for, for a long time. There are signatures also of persistent endotheliopathy. So in this study, they picked 50 patients, a median of 70 days following SARS-CoV-2 infection, and they measured the number of soluble uh, markers of endotheliopathy, including soluble thrombomodulin, also the antigen and propeptide for the bovilebran factor and factor eight, for example, and compare them with controls. And you can see here on this uh, heat map that a number of long COVID uh, patients had increased, uh, increased uh, biomarkers of, of endotheliopathy. And those biomarkers actually correlated. So the amount of, for example, bovilebran antigen or, or propeptide did correlate with six minute uh, walk test. So a number of our uh, patients must have that, not all of them uh, as, as, as shown here, but this is something that we need really need to take into account. Using sublingual video microscopy, this other group compared 27 long COVID patients with healthy volunteers and historical ICU controls, and they found a persistent capillary rarefaction with reductions on the density of uh, VESA overall, uh, here in the B graph, reductions in the density of capillaries, and also uh, reductions in different uh, scores uh, showing um, uh, microvascular health. Uh, long story short, I mean, uh, the, there's capillary rarefaction that remains, and, and this is there, and this is something we really need to, to tackle. Uh, a clear impact of long COVID is in the well in the brain and in the in, in cognitive function. Uh, there's a, a very nice uh, review in Neuron uh, 2023 by the uh, uh, by the group of uh, by Monge and Iwasaki. And uh, here's the summary also of a long long story. You start with respiratory COVID. This leads to neuroinflammation. There's increase of CV CF cytokines, chemokines, and also increase in microglial activity. This leads to objective neuronal and glial dysregulation with reductions in oligo dendrocytes, myelinated actions, hippo, reductions in hippocampal neurogenesis and astrocyte reactivity. And, and also uh, I, an issue, a question that's being, that's being investigated is whether this is also affecting myelin uh, plasticity. Uh, a clear example of the organicity in, in the brain. So some, I think that no one can, can deny that long COVID exists when you, when you read all these papers, is that, in, in, for example, in these cases, is non-human primate models. Uh, you see evidence of neuroinflammation uh, in, the, in, different, in different levels, but also neuronal pathology and cell death with increases in um, um, hypoxic ischemic injury, also neuron degeneration and apoptosis and micro hemorrhages are happening in many different uh, parts of, of the central uh, nervous system. It is also striking how the MPRO by itself, the, MPRO, the viral MPRO is able to mediate directly microvascular brain pathology, as you can see here. And also, um, and, and uh, so the virus is directly uh, damaging damaging uh, the capillaries by uh, inducing apoptosis and metoptosis. One final factor that has been shown and it's very consistent is also the effect. Uh, so the presence of this biosis in the gut dysbiosis. Um, so acute COVID leads to gut dysbiosis. It changes the proportion and the functions of the gut microbiome and leads to um, the increase in, in a number of, of, of pro-inflammatory bacteria and reductions in anti-inflammatory bacteria, which actually remain for more than one year, as you can see here in these, this graph. As I said, a lot of data, maybe we can dig deeper during the questions and answers, but the point here is that acute COVID might be in, induces already dysbiosis, and uh, and there's some rearrangement on these and these bacteria. Uh, but actually, uh, these dysbiosis remains set during the post-acute COVID, and this is actually associated clinically with a number a number of symptoms. So 
to finish, so the first question, what the heck is long COVID? I'm sorry for uh, the term. So long COVID is very important that long COVID is a real post-viral disease with clear organic involvement and very simultaneous pathophysiological alterations. There are subphenotypes which can be identified, but symptoms overlap and accumulate across clusters rather than separate into exclusive syndromic patterns. So this is an area for discussion. It is uncertain if they reflect independent pathogenic mechanisms or more likely, in my opinion, additive severity of a multisystemic multifaceted postviral disease. Subtypes may be useful to establish a prognosis. And long COVID overlaps, but it's different from PICS and from shorter term sequelae. Uh, and PACS, maybe it's more operational because it comprises everything, but it may also include different pathogenic entities. In terms of uh, mechanisms, viral persistence is clearly, uh, is clearly there. Um, we need to work. There's a, a window on, on, on soluble biomarkers, but we need to uh, work more and validate those markers a, a little bit uh, more, but there's a window there. Immune dysregulation exists. There are in peripheral blood, there are consistent inflammatory and immune activation profiles. There's a high overlap between controls and sometimes a small magnitude of change, which make it more complicated to move that into the clinic. And clearly in tissues, there's a clear picture of inflammation, necrosis, apoptosis, microthrombosis, endotheliopathy, and resident cell damage. So that in tissues, uh, the, I mean, the, it's, it's, it's very evident. Autoimmunity exists, but it's going to be very difficult to turn that, at least in my opinion, um, and that's open to debate into an objective biomarker. And in these uh, particular study, the differences were not, uh, were not that clean. There's an endocrine uh, uh, dimension with lower cortisolemia and long COVID that needs to be further explored. And the teleopathy continues to be a hallmark. It's a key, key hallmark of, of long COVID. Gut dysbiosis is also there. So that we need um, uh, interventions maybe to modify gut dysbiosis. And finally, vagus nerve dysfunction could explain part of, of, of the symptoms. Let me finish by just thanking, uh, first of all, the patients, because they have been, uh, in this case, the COVID persistent, the organization in Catalonia, but uh, there are uh, patient groups uh, everywhere. We've worked with them and, uh, um, and they have been uh, suffering a lot. And I'm, I'm very happy that we can um, make progress in these directions. And also the two leads uh, of our long COVID uh, work, which is Lourdes Mateo, who's the head of the long COVID unit uh, and the Department of Infectious Disease, and Marta Massanera, who's the coordinator of the long COVID research in, in the lab at Ersikasha and all the team. So thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm happy great. to take questions. Yeah. Yes. No, that was that was terrific. You, there's so much to unpack here. You really did a tremendous job summarizing an extraordinary body of literature that just grows every day. It's really hard to keep up with. Um, I want to encourage the audience to put their questions okay. in the Q&A. And we have a few here um, that I can start off with. And the first one um, is a, it's a little, uh, maybe a little bit left over from the previous talk, but I think it's important um, as we think about um, treating people with long COVID, some clinics have restricted, um, have very strict referral criteria. And basically you have to have proof of a positive test of having had COVID or a positive SARS-CoV-2 nucleocapsid antibody test. And the question is really how sensitive is that antibody test improving prior exposure, especially when people were um, infected early in the pandemic? And, and do you think that we really, th this is the population we need to be focused on as we try to move this forward? I think we need to trust patients. Uh, and as was said before, even if there are a couple of them who might just get some benefit, I mean, there are th hundreds of them that actually um, that actually need 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 care. So our role is to to we need to trust patients. In our in our clinic, also we have patients. We we do that all these tests, but we still have patients that were infected during the first uh, wave, and and we started taking care of them uh, without without those proofs, and they are identical to the other ones. So I mean, it's 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 just just the same. So I think we should we we should not necessarily respect to only patients with those proofs. And do you are you aware of data about just the durability of the nucleocapsid antibody response after an episode of COVID? Do we know of people who had documented COVID, you know, but RNA positive, how many of them retain mm -hmm. antibody for how long? 
It's difficult to say, particularly with, with Omicron, because the reality is that many patients become reinfected these days. Uh, I mean, and, and for us, it becomes really very hard to... We, we So far, before Omicron, uh, we could see a certain decay, but the nucleic acid antigen was, was, remained relatively detectable. Now, the truth is that, that we have... Uh, our patients uh, might become reinfected several times, like all of us. And what I think it's very important is that I maybe we can leave that for the discussion later on. But to me, long COVID patients should be considered high risk patients in terms of or prioritize them for Paxlovid or for antivirals, uh, because it's true that uh, it takes a, a, a long time to recover. Only a few of them recover, and and when they become reinfected, the chances of going back uh, are are important. Okay. Yeah. And I, I guess just following up on that, um, given what you learned and what you've presented about the potential pathogenesis of long COVID, what, how are you feeling about treatment um, of, of acute COVID with the mm -hmm. goal of preventing long COVID? Do you think that to be one of the indications for considering treatment or we don't know yet? Well, I think so. In my opinion, uh, I think that should be an indication. Uh, actually, if you think about with the current scenario, the baseline rates of hospitalization have uh, been have decreased to two percent, one percent, depending on, on the settings. Uh, whereas it's at least five to ten percent of long COVID uh, still. Uh, so, so we, and we know we have data from different antivirals. Um, that you can actually reduce at least 30, 30 to 40, maybe 50% the incidence of post-acute COVID symptoms. So, so I think it's just an issue of availability and cost and affordability. Why not? I mean, treating a virus the sooner the, the better. I mean, we just should not let the virus, you know, disturb the immune system and the earlier the better. Yeah. Okay. We'll come back to that. I want to get to some of the other questions. Dr. Sag asks, uh, he's giving you complete poetic license here and asking what is your best guess regarding what is causing long COVID in most patients? And I think this is looking for one answer <laughs> where there may not be, but, but what, do you, what do you think the sort of fundamental underlying process is here if there is one? If I had to pick one, it would be endotheliopathy, uh, uh, starting um, um, so microthrombosis or immunothrombosis at the beginning, which actually leads to everything else, um, which is induced by, by of course, SARS-CoV-2 presence and persistence, um, and and also, and then of course the vagus nerve alteration is really explaining a lot of things, but also the suprarenal. I think we, we need more information on the on the adrenal uh, axis. Uh, we need to understand better what happens with CR, CRF, what happens with ACTH. Maybe it's clearly it's not a clear secondary or tertiary hypoadrenalism, but maybe it's a functional issue. So we need to do functional tests and we really need to trust patients and dig deeper. That's what we have to do. Okay. And then a um, question about the incidence of, of, of PASC, whether it, it changes with new variants um, that are less pathogenic. So Omicron, for example. So, so I think that the recover has has looked into that in in their cohorts, and it decreases a little bit, but it's still it's around between five and ten percent, uh, like uh, with vaccines. So I think vaccines decrease fifteen percent the incidence, but but it, um, it's still there. It's not negligible at all. It's uh, it being very very optimistic. It's going to be five percent of new cases, and it's a lot of patients. Okay. Another question about the persistent spike antigen. Where does it come from? Active replication or just simply transcription of residual infectious virus? And what role um, does the vaccine play in persistent spike antigenemia? So where does it come from? The truth is that we don't know, uh, actually. So it, it, it could be both. Uh, it could be both. I think we also need to, for example, look in the fat, for example. So it could be both release of, of, of constant release of antigens by certain cellular uh, turnover. Um, but but the, we, we don't know. We need more information in that, in that sense. I just uh, want to acknowledge um, Julie Zartowski, who put um, in response to my question about 
the um, nucleocapsid and antibody said that most people they see in observational COVID study are nucleocapsid negative after about six months. But as you point out, it will depend on reinfection. Some yeah. folks stay positive for much longer, but not the majority. So I think maybe more reason not to rely on that test for a prior diagnosis of COVID. Yes. And, yes, and then um, maybe last question here um, before we move to our panel. Um, do you think long COVID is really distinct from other post-viral illnesses um, like ME-CFS or POTS after Lyme or EBV? So I think we should be very careful because we this is a, a syllogism that ha, we have been witnessing since the beginning of COVID-19. So the, our, ourselves, the HIV physicians, always said that, well, this is like HIV. We should treat patients with two or three drugs. We just make these syllogisms, and, and I don't think we know enough. It, it doesn't have to be the same exactly. I mean, uh, of course, there are several post-syndrome, uh, uh, post-viral uh, syndromes, but but it, it, this virus is different. Like every virus, this virus has a specific, uh, a specific, uh, you know, aspects like the spike is highly immunogenic. There are a number of different mechanisms. So even if there's some overlap between the different uh, sort of viral uh, viruses, I think we, we don't necessarily need to accept these uh, quick syllogisms. Great. Well, I'm going to ask you to stick around here because we're going to move into the next section, which is going to be a panel discussion. And I'll turn it um, back over to Dr. Del Rio to introduce the panel. Thank you so much again for that really comprehensive talk. Thanks a lot. Thank you.